There is no substitute for the preaching and teaching of God's Word. Each weekday on Enjoying the Journey, Scott Pauley leads us in a brief study of Scripture. Today, on the Weekend Pulpit, we are happy to share a full-length Bible message given through Scott's pulpit ministry. These messages were recorded live in a local church or gospel event in recent days. It is our prayer that the message will be a help to you today. I want you to open the Word of God with me, if you will, please, to the book of Hosea in your Old Testament. Probably not a book we go to very often. Probably we should go much more frequently because it is a book that reveals us the heart of God and the love of God for fallen sinners, which all of us qualify. What an amazing book it is. And I must tell you that when you come to the book of Hosea, you come to a story that is marked by sin and all of the sorrow and all of the suffering that grows out of it. But when you get to the end of the story, how many of you are glad sin is not the last chapter? That our failures is not the end of the story. That God is the God of new beginnings. When you get to the last chapter, you get to what I think is one of the greatest revival chapters in all of the Bible. It is Hosea chapter number 14. I still hear a few pages turning. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, Hosea, if that helps you any, all right? <laughs> Hosea chapter 14 and verse number 1 begins this way, O Israel. Let's just pause there a moment. Can you hear the heart of God? Can you hear the loving tone of the Lord whose heart is broken over the brokenness sin has brought? Sin is awful. Did you know sin's awful? And by the way, it's easy to spot everybody else's sin. I'm not preaching on everybody else's sin tonight. It's easy to talk about the, the decay in our society and the corruption of our civilization, but we must deal with our own sin, and God is dealing with His own people, and this is the way He speaks to them, like a father to a child. Oh, Israel. That word, oh, is an amazing word. It's a heart word. If I ask you to stand tonight and define the word O oh for me, what would you say it is? It's a word that defies definition. You can't define it because it is really more of a groan than it is a word. O oh is what you say when you can't say anything else. They said of the Welsh revival that one of the Mark's spiritual awakening was about to break out in another church. One of the first-hand observers said, he gave account and said, we knew revival was about to come there when the old returned to the prayers. Here we have the divine old. God's brokenness. Oh, Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. May I just ask, how many fallen people are here tonight? Would you raise your hand, please? Let's try that one more time. How many fallen people are here tonight? Would you raise your hand, please? If your neighbor's not raising their hand, put their hand up in the air, all right? Because we're all fallen people. We're a part of fallen humanity. When you come to this passage, you come to God's prodigal people. We're living tonight in a prodigal nation. Our nation has wandered far, far from the Lord. Almost to the point it is hard to recognize it. Yeah. And as surely as there are prodigal nations, there are prodigal families, and there are prodigal people, but let's get down to the dirty truth. The dirty truth is all of us have prodigal hearts. In fact, the writer of that great hymn, Come Thy Fount of Every Blessing, Tune My Heart to Sing Thy Praise, wrote in that hymn these words, Prone to Wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. The unknown story behind that song is that years after the man wrote those words, he was a minister, he got away from the Lord and he got out of church. And he got on a stagecoach one day in a neighboring town doing business. 
and a woman was sitting across from him that he didn't know, and the woman was humming a song. Would you like to guess what song she was humming? The song he wrote. And then she started singing it under her breath, and she was singing those words, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. And she looked up to see that, that this man was weeping across from her, and she said, do you not like my song? And he said, Madam, I'm the poor soul that wrote those words, and I'd give a thousand worlds if I could feel at this moment as I felt on the day that I wrote them. And it was the means, the glorious means of grace of turning his heart back home and back to the Lord and bringing him back into fellowship with God. I'm just going to tell you, you can dress it up for church, you can give it a Bible, you can let it go to family camp, but we are all fallen creatures, we all have a sin nature, we all have a fleshly bent, and we all have to say all the time, Dear Lord, I want to get right with you and I want to stay right with you. And so we come to a word tonight. In fact, every evening we've taken a word. How many of you have been here in all the meetings? Wait, let me just say, you've been here? All right, so stay with me, class, just a minute. Let's review. Go back in your mind, and if you must cheat and go back in your notes, you can. To the very first night, and I gave you a word. It was the starting point. It was God's early word. What was the word, please? Hear. We must hear from God. You got to get in tune with the Lord and ready to receive. And we came forward, and I gave you a second word. What was the second word, please? Come. come. So we hear the Lord, we respond to Him, we come to the Lord. By the way, these aren't my words, they're God's words that come straight from the book. And then last evening, we got a third word. What was the word? Remember, remember, the Lord is our memorial. Well, tonight, we get one more word. It is the key word here that really unlocks. Everything at the back door of the book. Look at Hosea 14, verse 1. O oh, Israel, what's that word, please? Return. Would you mark it in your Bible? O oh, Israel, return. Spurgeon said that Hosea 14 is a fair flower in the midst of a prickly shrub. He meant by that that the book really describes how awful sin is and all the terrible things it brings. And it was a mess. It messed up a family. It messed up a nation. It messes up everything it touches. Let me just show you something. Go back to chapter 1 for a second, would you please? Look at, look at Hosea chapter 1. Connect this to Hosea chapter number 14. Don't forget that the book of Hosea addressed an entire nation of people, but it was set in the context of the family, and God had something for every member of the family. And for the record, God has something for everybody in this room tonight. Look at Hosea chapter 1, verse 1, the word of the Lord that came unto Hosea. Everybody mark Hosea in your Bible, and you might write down that this is the husband and this is the father. How many husbands and fathers are here? Wait at me just a second. Husbands and fathers? Well, I want you to know, God has a word for you, and God wants you to hear him and come to him and remember him and return to him and lead your family in the paths of righteousness. Then you come down to verse number 3. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblim, which conceived and bare a son. Everybody mark the name Gomer in verse number 3 and write down somewhere that this is the wife. How many of you are glad we don't name ladies Gomer anymore? <laughs> i got to just get this out of the way. Every time I read this, all I can hear is Shazam in the back of my mind, you know? It's not good. <laughs> Gomer was her name. So you got Hosea, that's husband, and father. You've got Gomer, that's wife and mother. And then, would you mark in verse 4, Jezreel. That's their first son. So we know the men, and then we got the women. How many wives and mothers are here? Would you raise your hand, please? All right, so you fall in the Gomer category. And then you have Jezreel. How many young men are here? Sons. Would you raise your hand, please, all your sons? All right, so God has something for you. And then you come down to verse number 6. They have a daughter, and they called her name Loruhamah. How many girls are here? Daughters? Wait at me just a second, would you please? You glad you don't have a name like Loru Hama? It meant something. And then there's a third child in verse 9, another son, Lo Ami. I wish you had time to tell you what all the names mean and then how God changed the name when he changed the hearts and how it was a symbol of what he was doing in the entire nation. And this was a, a divided family. It was a family that was, that was destroyed because of sin, and yet the Lord marvelously put it all back together again. The God of the Bible is the God of all grace and the God of continuing mercy. And what God did for Hosea and Gomer and Jezreel and Lo Ruhamah and Loami and what God did for Israel and Judah, God wants to do in our nation, God wants to do in our family, God wants to do in our lives if we will simply return. 
And so we go back to Hosea chapter 14. I'm going to walk through this chapter with you. It's a chapter of divine possibilities. In fact, I was thinking this afternoon, looking at it again in the hotel room, I think Hosea 14 may be one of the most hopeful chapters in the whole Bible. <laughs> you know what sin does? Everybody look at you and look at me just a minute. You know what sin does? Just stomps you down. And while you're down there, you know what Satan does? Kicks you while you're down. You know what Jesus does? He reaches down. Picks you up. When you get to the end of this book, you, you come to the end of you, but you come to the beginning of God. When you get to the end of the book, he says you can go home different than you came if you're willing to come back to me. Just return. Listen to the heart of God in it. Begin in verse 1 and 2. O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast, that's past, fallen by thine iniquity, but don't live in your past. No. Verse 2, take with you words. And turn. Would you mark turn? The key is return. It starts with a turning. Turn to the Lord. Say unto him, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. So will we render the calves of our lips. Write it down, would you please? Number one. We'll give you three truths all from this chapter tonight. Number one, I want you to see first of all that there is an invitation to return to the altar. I love this. The preacher in this chapter starts with the invitation. What would you think? What would you think if I came in here tonight and we just read a text and I said, all right, let's have the invitation. That's essentially what happens here. The scripture is given and they get right to the invitation. And what is the invitation? You ready for this? Bring yourself and bring your sin and drag it kicking and screaming if you have to. But bring it to the altar. Do you know what an altar is? An altar is a place where things go to die. An altar is a place where you offer yourself entirely to the Lord. Look at, the, look at the picture of the altar. In verse number one, he begins by acknowledging need. He said, you better acknowledge your condition, where you are, and then when you get to verse two, don't just acknowledge it to yourself, admit it to God. Look at the phrase, take with you words. Mm. Did you know God wants to hear it? How long has it been since you had a real thorough time of just confessing sin to God? Like when was the last time you got in a room by yourself with nobody but you and the Holy Ghost and the Word of God and got down on your knees and just called it what God calls it? And don't blame anybody else and don't make excuse for it and don't call it some lighter thing that society has made it more acceptable by, by re-terming it. When was the last time you called it exactly what God called it? Can I tell you? That's the beginning of the returning. Are you listening? God wants you to say it. He wants you to speak it. He wants it to come out of your mouth. Now, don't miss this. You don't have to tell it to everybody else. You know why you don't have to tell it to everybody else? Because they're not your priest. Jesus is our great high priest. Amen. You don't have to tell everybody every bad thing you've ever thought and done. And all, no, but here's what you've got to do. You've got to bring that to a holy God, and you've got to be willing to take with your words and say to the Lord, Lord, I don't want this anymore. Get rid of all the sin in my life. Get rid of everything between me and God. Dear Lord, I want to be right with you again. And at that moment, you have returned to the first stopping off place, and that's the altar. Would you look at the end of verse number two? He even tells us what to say. Say this. Somebody says, I don't even know what to say. All right, say this. You ever pray scripture? This is a good scripture prayer. Say this. Take away all iniquity. Does your Bible say all? Lord, get all the crookedness out of me and receive us graciously. You know what that means? Lord, grace. Any other fallen sinners in here need any grace? You don't stretch your way to the presence of God. You don't plant your way into the throne room of heaven. You don't present yourself to God on your own merit. You come on the mercy of Jesus. When you get to the bottom, that's a good place to be because that's the place where God meets the broken and the contrite heart. When you have nothing to offer God but your fallen nature and your failure and you say it to God, God says, that's good enough for me. And look at the end of verse number two. He said, so we render, now mark this in your Bible, the calves of our what? That's a strange phrase. Would you mark that in your Bible? 
See, they, they were used to bringing calves to the altar. I'm talking about animals to the altar, animal sacrifice, blood sacrifice. But this is very important. God says, I don't want you to go through the religious motion. I don't want your calves. I don't want your animals. I don't want all the stuff you've been doing every week. I'm going to tell you what I want. I want you to bring yourself to the altar, and I want you to open your mouth, and I want you to say about your sin what I've been saying about your sin, and the moment you do, I will make you clean. Look, when you come clean with God, then God can make you clean. What are the calves of our lips? You remember in Romans chapter 10, we, we read that gospel text, it said, the word is nigh thee even in thy what? In thy mouth. That's why the Bible says, you believe in your heart and you confess with your what? It's not that you're impressing God. By the way, you don't talk God into forgiving you either. So stop trying to negotiate. God doesn't negotiate. You come on his terms and his terms alone. You don't convince God. Do you really think you've got to convince God to do what Jesus already died for? You think you've got to beg and plead with God to talk God into forgiving you and say all the right things? God's not impressed by your prayer. God is not impressed by your promises. God is not impressed by your good intentions. God's heart is captured by the broken heart of one that says, I got nothing but a mess, Lord, but I'm willing to give that to you. And at that moment, you're responding to God's invitation to come to the altar. It's like the psalm was saying in Psalm 51 that the Lord didn't want sacrifice and offering. What did he want? He wanted a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. This is the great sacrifice we must bring to the Lord. How many of you are glad you didn't have to bring a sheep in here tonight? Yes? No, just bring you. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. He's been the great sacrifice, the final forever full sacrifice for sin. We're not looking for sacrifice for redemption. That's already paid on the cross of Jesus. But let me tell you what sacrifice he's still looking for. The sacrifice of people who are willing to come to the altar and say, Lord, you're right about everything you've said and I'm wrong and I want to be right. I want to be clean again. It's the first step of returning. Then look at verse number three. Go on. Asher shall not save us. We will not ride upon horses. Neither will we say any more to the work of our hands. Ye are our gods, for in thee the fatherless findeth mercy. There's a lot in that verse. Look at verse number three. He said, nobody else can help us, only you can help us. Now, we're not going to trust in horses what, what something can do for us. We're going to trust in God. And we're not looking at what we can accomplish. We need what only God can accomplish. You know what verse 3 is? Verse 3 is essentially saying, I'm not trusting anything to be right except you. I love that. You know what's funny? We all understand this when it comes to people getting saved. But after we get saved, we stop living that way and we think somewhere we earn some kind of meritorious favor with the Lord. I don't care how long you've been saved, how long you've served the Lord, there is never a day that you deserve anything but hell and all of the mercy and goodness of God is because of God's undeserved grace in our lives. And we must remind ourselves of that every day. And look how Jesus responds. The Lord says in verse 4, I will. <laughs> Isn't it nice when the Lord says, I will? When you do your part, be sure he'll do his. Look at it. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely for mine anger is turned away from him. I've marked in my Bible the word turned there. When you turn, God turns. So number one, it's an invitation to return to the altar. Number two, there is confession that returns us to the house. First, we come to the altar just to get right, to get clean. And when you get to the altar, guess what the Lord does? The Lord says, wonderful. Now, come on back in the living room. Let's sit down and talk here a while. He brings you back into family fellowship. Look at it carefully. At the end of verse number three, he says, the fatherless findeth mercy. He said, look at those orphans. They got nobody. Hear the heart of the father in verse four say, I love them freely. My anger is turned away from him. Oh, this is glorious. Remember I said, this is the prodigal story. Look, the prodigal comes out of the far country when he returns, but he doesn't just come out of the far country. He comes all the way back into the father's house. 
The father didn't stop that prodigal on the porch and say, boy, you stay out here till you prove to me that you'll do better. What did the daddy do? He brought him right back in and set him at the father's table and gave him a robe and a ring and sandals. Listen to me. When God forgives you, he washes you in the blood of Jesus. He casts your sin as far as the east is from the west. He throws it into the sea of his forgetfulness. Stop bringing it up because God brings you back into his fellowship. Stop living on it. Stop talking about it at nausea. What you must do is believe that when you simply confess, God does the rest. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, I used to preach that passage all wrong. It's funny, when you study the Bible, sometimes the Bible will mess up what you think. I used to preach that verse like, come on now, come down here and plead with God to forgive you and beg God to forgive you. And, I mean, it was just ridiculous. That's not what the verse says. I started studying that word confess one day and I found out the word confess literally just means say the same thing. Watch this. The second you say about your sin what God says about your sin, God says, that's good enough for me. Can I prove it to you? Do you remember when the prodigal was coming home he had a little prairie practice? We've all done that, haven't we? And it went something like this, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. He must have prayed that a hundred times on his way home. He got it just exactly right. Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. You ought to go back and read Luke 15 and read the story again because when he gets back and daddy comes running off the porch and meets him right there in the middle of the road and throws his arms around him, he launches into his prayer, but this is all he gets out. He says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. And he never gets to finish, make me as one of thy hired servants. You know why? Because daddy interrupts him. I love it when God butts in. You know why I wouldn't like to finish the rest of it? Because God doesn't have any hired servants. The only servants God has are the ones who serve Him because they love Him out of grateful hearts that have been forgiven and changed. Listen to me, please. God's not interested in your promises to do better. God is interested in you simply saying, Truth, Lord. Yes, Lord. I'm a sinner, Lord. I'm unholy, Lord. I'm unclean, Lord. I'm unworthy, Lord. And the Lord says, That's good enough for me. Forgiven and cleansed at that very moment. You return, you return to the altar, but immediately when you get to the altar, it's the doorway back into the house. Look at the verse. He loves freely. He heals completely. Let me tell you what true repentance is. Look at it carefully. True repentance is you renouncing the false gods, little g of verse number three, and laying hold on the good God of verse number four. True repentance is you saying, I don't want anything to do with those old idols anymore that I set up. I want to serve a God who loves me and has healed my backslide. Look, this is what it means to return. There's a third thing. And everything builds to this. In fact, this is my favorite part of the whole book. It starts in verse 5. We're going to the garden. How many of you have a garden this year? Would you raise your hand? How many of you have a garden? My son decided a few years ago he was going to have his own garden. Now, Grandma and Grandpa have a garden. He had to have his own garden. And he was going to have his own chickens, too. When your kids have a garden and chickens, you have a garden and chickens. Did you know that? <laughs> and it reminded me of a lot of great truth. In the agricultural world of the Bible, they understood much of this language. Maybe some of us ought to get back out on the farm and learn a little something about it. But let me tell you what God does. You ready for this? When, when you come to the altar, God brings you into the house, and then you get to walk right out into his lovely garden. Look at the beautiful progression here. We, there's an invitation to return to the altar. There's confession that then returns you to the house. And then finally, there is restoration that returns you to the garden. You ready? Come on, walk through the garden with me. Look at verse 5. I'll be as the dew in Israel. He shall grow as the lily and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. His branches shall spread and his beauty shall be as the olive tree and his smell as Lebanon. They that dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall revive as the corn 
and grow as the vine. The scent thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim shall say, what have I to do anymore with idols? I have heard him and observed him. I am like a green fir tree. From me is thy fruit found. How many of you think there's a whole lot of plants in those verses? Would you mark them? In verse 5, there's the lily. In verse 5, 6, and 7, there's the cedars of Lebanon, three times mentioned. In verse 6, there's the olive tree. In verse 7, there's corn. In verse 7, there's a vine. In verse 8, there's the green fir tree. And then he tops it all off with the fruit tree. You ever wonder why? Why all these? Let me tell you what sin does. Are you listening with your heart right now? Let me tell you what sin does. It takes a garden and turns it into a barren wasteland. Don't take my word for it. Ask Adam and Eve. Because they lived in the most beautiful garden of all. When they sinned, what did their sin bring, dear ones? What did their sin bring? It brought thorns and it brought thistles. Do you know? Do you know where all the prickly things started? All the prickly things started. All the painful things started when man did his worst instead of believing God for his best. And suddenly we live in a desert wasteland, a barren, parched, dry, thirsty wilderness where nothing good seems to grow. And somebody says, well, I guess this is just the way it's going to be now. We don't live in the garden anymore. Oh, no, my friend. Can I tell you, when Jesus comes in, He changes everything. And the Lord has a way of turning the wilderness back into a garden again. Amen. It's amazing. Look, look I've got to show you this. Look back at chapter 13 for just a second. I noticed this today. Did you ever notice how chapter 13 ends just before the garden of chapter 14? Look at verse 15. He said, here's what sin does. Here's what your life was without me. Though he be fruitful among his brethren, looks like he's bearing fruit, an east wind shall come. The wind of the Lord shall come up from the wilderness and his spring shall become dry and his fountain shall be dried up. He shall spoil the treasure of all pleasant vessels. Samaria shall become desolate. God says, if you don't get right with me, I'm going to take everything you think is fruitful and I'm going to make it barren. I'm going to turn it into a dry wasteland. But the moment, blessed be Jesus, the moment you return Turn to me. I will take that wasteland and I will turn it back into a garden. Friends, only the heaven's gardener can do what we're talking about right here. That's why when Jesus came along teaching his disciples in John 15, he said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you just abide in me, you'll bear fruit. No, you'll bear more fruit. No, you'll bear much fruit. No, you'll bear fruit that remains. And by the way, why do you bear fruit? You don't bear fruit so somebody will brag on you. You bear fruit so all the glory will go to the husband. Somebody walks through your life and sees some good thing, they'll know in you that is in your flesh dwelleth no good thing, but Jesus must be at work in you. And when they see Christ in you, God himself will get all the glory for that. Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Not me. Oh Lord, thy love, thy joy, thy peace. Thy long-suffering, thy gentleness, thy goodness, thy faith, thy meekness, thy temperance. You know what's going on here? God is restoring things to the point that suddenly that which was dry and barren begins to bloom again. Let me show you something. Well, I promise we'll come right back. Go back to Isaiah just for a second. Just back a few pages in your Bible. Look at Isaiah 58 and verse number 11. When you get right with God and you do right before the Lord, here's what God promises. Look at Isaiah 58, verse 11. And the Lord shall guide thee continually. How many of you need God's guidance right now? Yes? All right, he promises it. But he promises even more. And satisfy thy soul in drought. We're living in dry days, friends, but you don't have to be dry. And make fat thy bones. Some of you say, well, I'm already there. Oh, we're not talking about physical things. No, we're talking about spiritual health and spiritual life and spiritual beauty. 
I was in Africa years ago. First time I'd ever been in that part of the world. And I'm walking through a marketplace. And it was fascinating. I saw a woman carrying a, a, a kitchen table on her head and a, a chair in both hands. She was a, she was a one-woman kitchen mover, let me tell you. It was amazing. And we walked through the marketplace. I was with another guy. And this African woman shouted out at us and said, Hey, beautiful men, come over here, beautiful men. I thought, man, I like this place. They, they recognize good-looking people Later that day, the African pastor was hosting and said, now your culture is very different than ours. He said, for example, in our culture, in your culture, it's beautiful to be skinny. In our culture, the fatter you are, the more beautiful you are. And then I realized she was saying, hey, fat boys, come over here, you know. <laughs> and the reality is, there is a fatness, spiritual health, vitality, strength that the Lord puts in you when you get right. Look at the end of it. And thou shalt be, stay with me now, and thou shalt be like a what? A watered garden. And like a spring of water whose waters fail not. Some of you right now, you're just growing thorn bushes. That's all you're growing. Congratulations. Hey, you're just growing a bunch of thorn bushes. But I want you to know, you let the Lord till up the soil of your heart and break up your fallow ground, put the good seed in again, let the water of the Holy Ghost begin to water it again. You'll start bringing forth good fruit again. Go back to Hosea chapter 14. Did you notice when we read the garden a minute ago, he started not with us but with him. In verse 5, he starts with his I wills. And what does he say? He said, I'll be like the dew unto Israel. What is dew? Dew is the gentle refreshing. Aren't you glad in a harsh world God brings gentle refreshing? You know what do is? It is the quiet refreshment of heaven. Every good and perfect gift coming down from above to satisfy our soul. By the way, Israel understood the dew. Do you remember in ancient Israel when they were in the wilderness and the dew fell? Guess what they found amongst the dew the next morning? There was manna every time the dew came. Look, when the dew comes, the Lord satisfies the deepest needs of your life. And then you come down to verse number 7. He doesn't just give dew, he gives his shadow. You get under his protecting shade to shield you from all the harsh elements. L listen to me, friends. Only God can make your life a fruitful garden again. Now, this is what he'll do if you let him. Would you just make the list with me quickly? Maybe in the margin of your Bible you'll write them down. Take the list. Look at verse 5. He said you'll be like a lily again. You remember the lily of the... I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. The lily of the what? Oh, so you're in the valley right now? God grows beautiful things in that valley. Would you write next to the lily that this is the return of beauty? Sin only brings ugliness, but when you return to the Lord, beauty returns again. Funny thing about lilies, the bulbs lie beneath the surface, dormant all through the winter months. Some of you have been in winter for a while. It's been pretty cold and hard and indifferent. But I want you to know, God has not forgotten you. God has not forsaken you. God has not failed you. And He's not about to start now. There is life beneath the surface. You still belong to the Lord and He belongs to you. And if you will return to Him, He will bring the beauty back in your life again. And then you got the cedars of Lebanon. Three times it says it. And it's interesting, two different things. In verse 5, it's the roots of the cedars. And in verse 6 and 7, it's the smell or the fragrance, the sweetness of it. This is so good. Look, please. Your life goes down and your life goes out. It gets rooted in the Lord. Let me tell you how to be ready when the storms of life come so you won't get blown away. You get deeply rooted in the Lord Jesus. You get deeply rooted in the Word of God. You get deeply rooted in the Holy Spirit and you'll draw from those resources all the time. And I'm going to tell you, when people get around you, they'll say, I don't know what that smell is, but I really like that smell. I'm going to tell you what that smell is. That smell is the goodness of God in your life. It is not you. It is the fragrance of Almighty God upon your life. And then, read on, you've got the lily, you've got the cedars, you've got the olive tree. Did you know the olive tree was a staple in that society and necessary to life? You know what this is? It's the return of usefulness. The olive oil was used as medicine, it was used for food, it was used for lots of different reasons. It was used to keep the lamp burning. It was useful. Oh, this is so good. Watch this. When you return to the Lord, the Lord puts the beauty of the Lord God back upon your life. The Lord begins to root you in Him and puts His beautiful fragrance upon you again. And then He makes you useful again. You that were unprofitable are now profitable. You that were not able to be used are now able to be used. What is this? This is what God does when we return to Him. 
And then look at it carefully, there's the corn. I got to tell you, to this point, I mean, I'm looking at the beautiful lily and the majestic cedars of Lebanon and, and that gnarly looking olive tree that was so necessary, and then corn? Ever wonder why a stalk of corn grows in this garden? Jesus answered that question. He said, except a corn of wheat fall in the ground and die, it abideth alone, but, are you ready for it? If it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. You know what corn is? It's representative of life after death. Listen to me. The empty tomb's always on the other side of the cross. You know what God wants? He wants you to die. Can I ask every person in the room to lift your head and look me in the eye just a moment? Have you died yet? Somebody said, no, preacher, I'm trying to live as long as possible. I'm not talking about your physical death. Have you died to self? Have you died yet? See, everybody wants the new life without the death of the old man. You've got to reckon self dead. You've got to come to the end of you if you want God to grow your garden. Keep reading. You come to the vine. What's the vine? The vine in Scripture, a picture of growth, a picture of pleasure, of joy, of every good thing. Oh, you know what sin does? It just saps the life out of you. In fact, I, I think I've come to this conviction that the greatest chastening God brings into the life of His children when they sin is they lose His joy. You know who the most miserable people on earth are? They're not lost people. They're saved people out of fellowship with God. And I'm going to tell you why. Because lost people don't know what they're missing out on. But if you've known the joy of the Lord and your vine is all shriveled up, the Lord knows how to bring you to the end of yourself. Some of you are sitting here thinking, yeah, preacher, but you don't know what I got to deal with. I'm glad you brought that up. Go back to Genesis just for a second, would you please? Look at Genesis 49. You know Joseph. You know the Old Testament Joseph. How God worked in his life in hard places with difficult people. Well, look what the Bible says about him in Genesis 49, verse 22. Joseph is a fruitful bough. By the way, this is after the pit. This is after Potiphar. This is after the prison. This is after the famine. This is after all of it. He's a fruitful bough. Listen to me. You can be fruitful. How? Even a fruitful bough by a well. Can I tell you? There's no fruit if you don't have something to draw from. But when you get rooted in the right source, you'll be like a tree planted by the river of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. This is the supply of the grace of God. But look at the end of verse 22. Whose branches run over the wall. Some of you say, you don't know what I got against me, preacher. No, I don't. But I know this. God can make it so you just grow right over that wall. The only thing limiting you is your unbelief and your disobedience. And if we are willing to believe and obey God, God says, I'll make it fruitful again. Go back to Hosea 14 and look at the end of it. You got the lily and the cedars and the olive tree and the corn and the vine. And then he brings us to two in verse number eight that I just am fascinated by. There's the green fir tree. You ever wonder why a fir tree shows up here? What is a green fir tree? It's an evergreen. That's exactly right. It's an evergreen. My wife is from Michigan. I'll be there preaching next week. And where we live, we have four very distinct seasons in the mountains. And, and mostly, all of our trees, they turn beautiful in the, in the fall, the autumn of the year, and then they all fall, and they're, they're gone. But where she is from, it is almost all evergreens. And this is what is so wonderful. Let me tell you what God will do. When you get thoroughly right with Him, let the Lord be thorough with you. I'm going to tell you what God will do. God will make it so that you can be blessed and you can grow at every season. You know, the evergreen is a reminder of, the evergreen is a reminder that God works even in the winter months and that you can know His perennial supply. And then God couples the evergreen with the fruit tree. For me is thy fruit found. Don't get selfish about it either, by the way. That fruit's not for you. No, no. No, when you get a lot of fruit, it feeds a lot of other people. My wife said to me, I called home, she said, we went to the blueberry patch yesterday, picked several gallons of 
blueberries. I know the people that own those blueberry trees. And she said, Scott, she said, you wouldn't believe it. She said, everywhere you turn, massive handfuls of blueberries and, and big blueberries. Somebody else grew them. They were in somebody else's orchard. But we're getting the benefit of it now. Oh, don't miss this. When you get thoroughly right with God, you won't just be blessed. You'll be a blessing. It won't just be so you'll be right. It's so you'll be bright for the Lord and God can work through you to meet the needs of other people. And in the end, all glory goes to the gardener. Let me just ask, how many of you would rather live in the garden of Hosea 14 than the barren wasteland of the previous 13 chapters? So we come to the final verse. Look at verse 9. Who? Good question, isn't it? Who is wise? And he shall understand these things. Prudent? And he shall know them. For the ways of the Lord are right. And the just shall walk in them, but the transgressors shall fall therein. You know what verse 9 basically says? It says you either understand this, know this, and obey this, or you miss the garden. If you want God's best on your family, if you want God's blessing upon your life, there is no other way than to return. Let a preacher come through and preach on politicians and the abortion crowd and the sodomites and everybody else. And everybody, Amen, preacher, that's good preaching. They need to get right with God. Yeah, they do. But the reality is it never starts there. It must start here. <laughs> Have you ever prayed that God would be thorough with you? Now be careful if you pray it, because he'll, he'll answer. He'll start showing you stuff you didn't know was there. He'll start turning over rocks, showing you little thorn bushes growing in your garden that need to go that you didn't even recognize. Lord, be thorough with me. John Owen, the old Puritan, took a church in a village Interestingly enough, Richard Baxter had much the same experience, described it almost identically, but John Owen said he took this church, a little country church in a community. He was so excited. He just knew he was going to preach the gospel and lots of people were going to get saved. And he preached for six months and nobody got saved. <laughs> nobody got baptized. Nobody joined the church. Nobody got right with the Lord. Nobody. And let me speak as a preacher and tell you, you, you preach straight and hard for six months and there's not so much as a holy grunt. You wonder, is something wrong with me? And he started to pray, Lord, something's missing here. And he said the Lord led him to make appointments with every family in his church. He said they were coming to the services, but something was missing. So he set appointments with every family in his parish, and the agreement was he would only come to their house if every member of the family would be there. Every member. Husband, wife, son, daughter. They would gather around the big family table. They would sit all the way around the table. And then he would say to them, do you have a family Bible? Almost every home had a family Bible then. And they would bring that big old family Bible out and lay it in the middle of the table. And he said, the first thing I would do, he said, I would go around the table and I would say to every member of the family, tell me how you got saved. Now tell me how you got saved. Now tell me how you were born again. Now tell me how you came to know Christ. And he said the first thing he realized in a hurry was he had a lot of lost church members. So he took that Bible and the first thing he did in every home was he gave the gospel and he explained how every member of the family had to be saved themselves. It's not a Christian home just because everybody says they're a Christian. It's not even really a Christian home just because everybody is a Christian. Christ must be at his rightful place in that home. But it begins with everybody being born again and he led many of his church members to the Lord Jesus. Might I say as an evangelist, I'm convinced we got a whole generation of people all over the world who've grown up thinking we're okay. Many of them have never truly been regenerated and know Christ as their Savior. That's the first thing we've got to settle. Then, he would take that big old family Bible, he would open it to a portion of Scripture that he had chosen, a psalm, something. He didn't preach a sermon. He just read Scripture. When he got to the end, he would bow his head and pray. And he would pray his way around the table. 
and pray for every member by name and let every person call his name to God or her name to God. And when he said amen, he would close the Bible, slide it across the table to the head of the household and say to that person, now what I have just done with your family, you must begin to do. And he established what he called in that day family altars, the return to the altar, you see. Not the church altar first, no, no. In the home. Because none of us are better Christians than we are in the privacy of our own home. John Owen said within a matter of weeks, spiritual awakening had come to their town. He said there were so many people trying to get in the church building they could not accommodate them. There were people being baptized every service and added to the church. The, the bars shut down. The prisons were empty. People were getting right with the Lord. And this is what old Mr. Owen said. He said, it did not happen when I preached better sermons at church. It happened when the people returned to the Word of God themselves. May I say something to you? May I say, look at me please, listen to me please. May I say, we've been waiting for some preacher to blow through town and preach a better sermon, and maybe that's what's wrong with us. We're waiting on somebody while God's waiting on us. We've been looking to men instead of looking to the Lord. I'm going to tell you what we all need to do. Look back at verse number one. We all need to return to the Lord our God. And when we return to the altar and the house and the garden, the Lord will do what only He can do. If this Bible message has been used of God in your life, or we can pray for you in some definite way, please contact us at enjoyingthejourney.org. We hope you will share the message with others who may also be encouraged by it. For additional full-length Bible messages, please visit Dr. Scott Pauley's YouTube channel. Tomorrow is the Lord's Day, and we want to encourage you to be faithful to attend a Bible preaching church in your area this Sunday. Thank you for listening to The Weekend Pulpit. And don't miss Enjoying the Journey daily devotional podcast each Monday through Friday.